Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with sort of another stream of consciousness. Not not quite as much as, um, oh, reflection on why not be evil. There we go. I should finish my thought before I delve into tangents. Why not be evil? Now, right off the bat, let me be clear. I am not advocating being evil. Instead, um, I think you should be good. Let me make that clear. What I want to explore are the reasons that someone might give for why we should be good and investigating those reasons a little bit more and then unsurprisingly arriving at the reason why we as Christians should be kind. Loving is another word we could use. The reason I'm using kind specifically is that I was in Menards uh, the other day and I saw a sign it was a, a thing you could buy, right? A sign you could hang in your house. And it said something like this. In a world where you can be anything, be kind. Now, on the one hand, that's a very important statement and one that I think each one of us should take to heart. But it made me wonder, why? Why? Now, again, um, I am advocating being kind. I think that's a good thing to do for the right reason. And what I want to do is talk about a few of the reasons that are not so good. And that's what leads me into sort of this stream of consciousness reflection. I do have some points. Interesting, if I point over here, that's literally where they are in my computer, but I'm pointing right at them now. Interesting, that's not really a problem for anyone, just a thing that I have learned today. I, I do have some points written down that I'm going to try to follow. So the first reason why we should be kind is that it's how you would want other people to treat you. And some people, um, if someone would give this reason, they might even quote our own Lord and Savior Jesus, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. However, we're going to examine this first in the non-Christian, not Jesus-believing atmosphere, because we are going to circle around to that at the end, and that will become, spoiler alert, the final reason, the best and only reason for being kind. But first of all, separating faith in Christ from this response, it's how you would want other people to treat you. Sounds like a really great thing, but it doesn't work. It does not work. And here's what I mean. If I treat another person with kindness, they are under no compulsion whatsoever to treat me with kindness. If I am patient and listening and um, whatever with another person, they can be a jerk to me, right? The, the, the fact that I am any such way with them, in this case kind, does not guarantee whatsoever that they are going to treat me like that. So the reason given is ultimately a failure of a reason. It just plain doesn't work. It doesn't work. Instead, it actually leads us to the opposite conclusion. Well, if me being kind to someone does not cause them to reciprocate, then instead, what's the best way to ensure a certain behavior? Well, that would be through threats, coercion, punishments. So it leads us to be threatening, punishful, evil to other people in the hopes that they would be good to us taken to the extreme, um, the government has power to do this, right? They can become tyrannical, enforcing, passing and enforcing all sorts of laws to try to legislate a certain behavior. Not saying our government does this, but in theory, a government has the potential to do this, to, to cause and coerce by threats and punishments a certain type of behavior. And that's actually, um, again, aside from Christianity, the best way to enforce a certain behavior. Now, if you talk to any police officer, it's actually quite hard to, uh, again, coerce people to be a certain way, which is why we have people who do illegal things, because this, this is a big problem, right? It's a big problem causing other people to be kind. If everybody were kind to one another, my goodness, I, I can't even imagine how different things would be, right? How many professions would be obsolete because people were just kind to one another and did things for one another and looked looked out for each other. 
it kind of sounds a little bit like heaven. A, um, being kind to one another because they want, because that's how you would want them to treat you, leads us down to the opposite conclusion. Me being nice, to, me being kind, that's my key word here, let's just keep using it. Me being kind to someone does not affect, is not guaranteed to affect their behavior. And, and can sometimes even have the opposite problem where you seem to be a pushover or easy or whatever. And so people take advantage of you because you have been kind. So it leads us to instead be cruel to other people or domineering or to exert some kind of power or influence over them in the hopes that we can cause them to be kind to us. So the first reason, the, the golden rule, again, as we separate it from our Lord, the golden rule is not, it, it fails as the reason for being kind. Again, separated from our Lord. Another reason why we might be told to be kind is that it makes for a better society, which, again, is one of those things that sounds really good, except it fails. We don't need everyone to be kind in order to have a better society. We just need most of the people to be kind to one another. So, so all of you other people can be kind to one another. I, for the sake of example, I'm going to be evil to ensure that other people are kind to me. I'm not going to sacrifice my own interests or desires for some kind of ethereal general good. If I want a thing, I'm going to go out and make sure that I can get the thing, right? I'm not going to let kindness stand in the way of pursuing my own interests. The fact that it might make for a better society is, is too, too abstract of a concept. How does me being polite to an individual make the whole world a better place? Well, the fact is that it doesn't, right? That single interaction on its own is far too small to, to have world-altering effects. Now, you could make the case that, well, no, that one interaction is not. But if everybody were like that, then it would have a better society. And again, 99% of the people should be kind to one another. But I'm not. I'm going to uh, exert that power or authority or whatever I have to make sure that my interests are satisfied. Other people can be kind. They can go to the back of the line and wait in line. I'm going to push my way into the front so that I can get my business done and be on my way. I don't need to be kind. The rest of you guys will make a better society. And so this reason also leads us to failure. Why should we be kind? Well, it makes for a better society. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. You don't necessarily have to be kind for a better society. There just has to be enough people who are kind to one another in order to make this place better. So it, it sort of works, and we're on a little bit better of path. But again, it applies to kind of an abstracted humanity. As long as humanity as a concept is kind, the world as a concept is a better place. These reasons are both internal. They're internal and they ultimately point you in towards yourself. Consider the first reason. It's how you want other people to treat you. So think about yourself, the first reason says, and how you would want people to treat you and then modify your actions that way. But you become the basis for what kindness is. Maybe you don't mind if people cut in line in front of you. Or maybe you don't mind having to, I don't know, what's another example? Pay more for something. Or maybe you don't mind sitting there listening to another person while they're talking um, without being able to talk yourself, right? These are just some examples. But they look at yourself. And so kindness for you can mean something different than it does for the next person because you, as a person, are the measure of kindness. Consider how you would want to be treated and then treat other people that way. There's not an even flat um, objective degree of kindness. Instead, it's, well, what are those things that you don't mind happening to you? Don't worry about those. 
And what are those things that you do mind very much when they happen? And make sure you pay attention to those. So it's going to cause you to overlook some areas because each of us don't mind. I can't come up with an example. Oh, my kids crying in the middle of church, right? I don't even hear it, honestly. Some other people might, right? Some other people might. So being kind for me, just as an example, I don't care. It, I, I don't even hear, I don't hear kids crying in the middle of the church service. So that would not enter into my mind as a way of being kind. Whereas someone else might be very much concerned by that. And it might cause them an untold amount of uh, concern. And so kindness for them. And so that ratchets way up to like the number one spot as far as kindness. And so we have this, this huge discrepancy. What does it mean to be kind? Well, it means being quiet in church in this one particular example for this person over here. But for this person over here, it's not a concern at all. Again, there's not an even flat objective kindness because we're, because we're looking inside of ourselves. We become the judges of kindness. And so it can mean different things to different people. Now, I said in the introduction, well, the, in the first part, that we were going to circle back around to Jesus and to the golden rule. And we have to do it in the right context. Because we should not be surprised that a thing that our Lord had said is both important and true. And Jesus did say that we should treat other people in the way that we want to be treated. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so we follow our Lord's words because of our love for other people. But it, it's not an internal reason from these other things. Instead, our Lord has shown us how he treats us. And that's what motivates us to show that same level of kindness to other people. Our Lord showed us the greatest kindness when we were hostile to him, when we were enemies of him, when we wanted to have nothing to do with him, when we were treating him with, with indifference or hatred or uh, scorn or whatever, our Lord overcame that brokenness and that wall of hostility. Our Lord overcame that through his death and resurrection. Our Lord showed us, not just in those words, he didn't just say, yeah, you should, you know, do things the way that you would want them done to you. Our Lord showed us what that means. And he didn't take our bad example. He didn't say, well, fine, if those people are going to be jerks to me, then I'm just going to be jerks to them right back. No, our, our Lord took all of that hatred and all of that despisement upon himself and he took it to the cross. And he buried it. Our Lord shows us what it means to be kind, to be loving to other people. It means sacrificing ourselves. Our Lord calls us to, to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow him. So the reason why we as Christians are kind to one another has nothing to do with ourselves. It's, it's not an internal reason where I can be the judge of kindness. Instead, we look to our Lord, who has shown us the ultimate kindness, who, who has paid the price of all of our broken sinfulness, who has removed hostility and allowed us to have the freedom to love him and to love other people. And that love comes out in our kindness to other people. And again, it's not I'm going to be kind in the way that I want. It doesn't look inside. Instead, it looks outside. I'm going to be kind to that person over there in the way that they want to be kinded to. So if that person is concerned about whatever, I'm going to show kindness in that specific way. That thing might be important to me. It might not. I, could, I, might, I might care less about that thing. But if it's important to that person over there, I'm going to show kindness to them by, by doing it that certain way or whatever. 
So it, it takes the reason outside of us and again sends it up to our Lord who has shown us kindness in his death and resurrection. And Jesus empowers us to show kindness to others. Paul says it a few times in his letters. Um, it's in Corinthians. Corinthians 10 or 11? 1 Corinthians 10 or 11. Something about um, eating... Eat, eh, this is going to sound like a weird example, but let me, let me play it out. Eating food sacrificed to idols. And so Paul, he says two different things that kind of illustrate this point. Um, he says an idol is nothing. So if there's food that has been sacrificed to an idol and an idol is nothing, then nothing has happened to that food and you can eat it with a clear conscience, right? So if you have this view that, oh yeah, idols are meaningless and empty and vain and nothing. And so eating food sacrificed to idol would be, to bring it kind of into a modern context, if somebody said a prayer to uh, one of the Hindu gods before the meal, that prayer is worthless, right? That prayer doesn't mean anything. You you, you might not want to, I mean, you might want to hang out with that person. Um, you could probably tell them about Jesus. But that prayer doesn't do anything. It doesn't like taint the food or the meal or anything. You can still engage in that meal. And the food offered to an idol since an idol is nothing, nothing has happened. That food isn't special in any way. Except, Paul says, except if that would grieve your brother's conscience. He, sa he says, and this is kind of a loose paraphrase, consider if your brother or sister is still wrestling with the idea of prayers to other gods, food sacrifice to idols. And they see you eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. Then, then they would consider that maybe we don't have to worship Jesus alone. Because you over there are participating in this idol's meal. You're eating food that has been offered to another god. So, so you must believe that that god is real. And not only that, but you're taking part in, in this ritual to this other god. So maybe it's okay for us to worship Jesus and this other God too. See, then my action offends my brother's conscience. And, and even though I might be one of those people who says, an idol is nothing, I can do whatever I want. I can eat that food and there's no problem, which, which is true and right and good. If it causes our brother to stumble, if it wounds his conscience, then we need to be kind. We need to modify our actions for the sake of our brother and show them kindness in the precise way that is important to them. So we've come around full circle. Why not be evil? Because Jesus said not to. And Jesus showed us not to. It's the most important thing. He showed us that we shouldn't, that he was not going to be evil, regardless of any of the shoulds or oughts or whatever. Jesus was not going to be, was not evil to us. He was the definition of kindness to us, giving up his own life, sacrificing himself for your sake and mine. And now he calls us to show that same kindness to our brothers and sisters. And it's going to look very different to different kinds of people. That brother or sister over there might need kindness in a certain way, and that one over there might need it in a totally different way. It's not up to us to define kindness, and so we can't say, I'm going to do X all day, every day, and it's going to be totally fine. Because there's some days where you might need to add something, or take something away, or phrase it in a certain way, so that this person over here sees you being kind to them in a way that is important and meaningful for them. And then this person over here who has a different view sees you still being kind in a way that is meaningful to them. That's why we should not be evil. Our Lord has showed us by his own example what kindness is. And now he calls us to be kind to others. So I commend to you kindness. Not for its own sake, 
but because Jesus has shown us and told us how to do it. I'll see you next time. God's peace be with you.